Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you again um, that we have gotten up today and we're here to celebrate you and worship you. Uh, thank you for Keith and his willingness to do Sunday school with us. And uh, we praise your name for all you do for us each and every day. And now for this time, we ask your blessings on all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so today is going to be a little bit different. We're not doing like one verse at a time. Uh, we're going to finish up the book of Colossians, which is verses 10 through 18. Um, these are greetings from the different individuals, and we're going to take a look. And this, a lot of it is going to kind of be history, looking at the people that that are in these greetings, and then we're going to finish off with Paul's final greeting. Um, so I want us first to, to read through the passage. Can we start at verse 10? Somebody read it, and then we'll just read around. And pass it off or keep going? Yeah, okay. where each one is separated, just read. All right. Uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, for whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. 11. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a slave of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings, always striving for you in his prayers, that you may stand complete and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Greet the brothers who are in Laodicea and also Nympha in the church that is in your house. And when this letter is read among you, have it also read to the church of Laodiceans, and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. And say to you, Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. The greeting is in my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And as I was saying, this um, is his final greeting, his closing to, to them. And he's actually giving greetings for the individuals who were actually helping him support the ministry as he's in prison at this specific time. And he, first of all, names um, Aris <laughs> um, Aristarchus. That's as close as I'm going to get. Um, and he is also mentioned. He's actually, again, when we, when we look at these things, um, the first mention of him by by name had been he had been traveling with Paul not exactly sure where it was except that that he started traveling with Paul after Paul had been in Macedonia because if we look at Acts 19:29 we see it says and the city was filled with confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along with Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So we see again, Paul had picked them up in Macedonia, um, which uh, somebody want to read um, Acts 20, 1 through 4. And again, this took place about five years prior to this letter to the apostle, to the Colossians. Now, after the uproar had ceased, Paul, having summoned and exhorted the disciples, said farewell and left to go to Macedonia. And when he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece, 
And there he spent three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And he accompanied Sopar of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy and Tychus and Trophimus of Asia. So we see here the mention of actually quite a few people that... Paul had working with him even in his imprisonment. And, and again, as we saw last week, uh, we saw that these, these people were primarily um, examples of faithfulness, that, that Paul is talking about them as faithful servants. And, and these people, for the most part, had been with Paul for a long period of time. So we see a faithfulness of service, and not just a faithfulness of service, but a faithfulness of service to assist Paul even when he was in prison. Now, he wasn't, when we're thinking about this, he wasn't like in a what we would picture as a jail cell. It was more like a house for rest. He was in a, in a house. He couldn't go anywhere else. But these people were with him, helping him, helping him do the things, relay messages, help in writing letters and other things of this case. Now, again, Paul at the end of this says he wrote this specific letter with his own hand. But we see again this idea of faithfulness, that these guys had a history with Paul, that they were not just briefly passing through Paul's life. They had worked with him. They had traveled with him. They had spent time with him, even in the hard circumstances. And we also see um, here, he talks about, um, he says also, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. Now, Paul, again, Mark is not with Paul, and he's not currently with them, but he's anticipating Mark to show up there, which is important also. And notice he mentions him as the cousin of Barnabas, and, and that's an interesting thing because, <clears throat> as we see, somebody want to read Acts 15, 37 through 41. And Barbarus wanted to take John, called Mark, along with him, then also, but Paul kept insisting that they should take, should not take him along, who had deserted them in Palthia and had not gone with them to work. And there was such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barbarus took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Cilicia and left being committed by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, it's interesting to notice, and I, I, I like actually seeing passages like this because they are showing real history here, real life. This was an argument, an argument between Barnabas, who was known as the son of consolation, he was also the one who brought Paul basically into the fold in Jerusalem when Paul first got saved. Nobody wanted to talk to him. He's the guy that went around killing all, all the people that were Christians, having them thrown in jail and, and, and brought before to be, be put to death for their heresy as Paul saw it and as the Jews of the day saw it. And yet when God in his mercy and grace intervened in Paul's life and Jesus confronted him, he got saved. Complete change of life, complete change of heart, complete change of who he was as a person. Still zealous for God but zealous for God in the right way. And yet, 
Nobody would trust him, except for Barnabas. Barnabas brought him and encouraged a relationship with him and the other apostles in Jerusalem. And we see now here this argument coming between Barnabas and Paul over Mark, who we see in this letter is actually Barnabas' cousin. So there was a relationship there with Barnabas, and Barnabas being the person he was, wanted to encourage Mark, wanted to give him that second chance, wanted to bring him, if you will, back into the fold. Yes, Mark had left. We're not certain of the reason, but he had left. Paul was upset at wanting to take Mark along, and Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement about it to the point where they couldn't work together. Isn't that interesting that even Paul, as much as we see him as this person who wrote so much of the New Testament and who was a standard for the Christian faith, he had his moments. I think that's a lesson for us as well is that we fail. And Paul later came to understand that failure. And he later came to understand that, yes, Mark did deserve a second chance. We see that later on in, in his life and in, in the, uh, what we'll see in that passage. But in this case, there was this disagreement. And again, nothing happens that God isn't in control of. Notice how Barnabas and Mark go off in one direction and Paul and Silas go off in another direction. And yet, both of them were used of God going in different directions. It actually broadened the scope of their ministry. So God used this difficult time in their lives in spite of their argument, in spite of the reason they broke up, God used it for his glory. That's an amazing thing to think about, that in spite of us, God can still use us for great things. Sometimes the lessons that people may learn from us are not from our good behavior. They may be lessons that they get because, well, I wouldn't want to do what that person just did. I wouldn't want to face the consequences of those kinds of actions. Those are still lessons, positive lessons. Not saying that we should go out and do that. We should always try to learn from our mistakes and again, try to teach the wisdom we've learned from having learned from our mistakes. And Paul does that later on when he, when he asks for Mark. Um, but in this case, we see him and, and, and Barnabas had, you know, had this disagreement over Mark, but Mark ended up becoming a faithful servant after having give, been given that second chance that Paul was not willing to give. And then he continues on by talking about Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greeting, and also Demas. Luke was someone, again, who he was instrumental in writing both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And Luke was off and on a traveling companion with Paul. We see that where sometimes in the book of Acts it talks about we did this and we did that, which is when Luke was actually traveling with Paul. And then 
we see also third person references to Paul and others in doing the ministry where Luke wasn't there, but he received this information. And as he says in the beginning of the book, compiled this information for history. Now it's God who moved him to do this. And again, the book of Acts became an important piece of history for us to see. So we see Luke and we also see Demas. Uh, somebody want to read 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 11. Be diligent to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present age, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Notice here two things we see in this passage, and this is Timothy. Timothy was written actually later in Paul's ministry. So when Paul is talking about Demas here in Colossians, Demas was still a faithful servant, but somehow, as Paul judged it, Demas forsook the ministry. He left. But, and, and again, Paul is being honest. He says, Demas, having loved this present age, deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Now, he's talking about being alone and not having anyone else to help him. But two of these people, two of these three people he mentioned, went on business. Paul doesn't say the same thing about them as he does about Demas. So Demas, for some reason, left the ministry, left the work. We don't know fully the details. All we do know is Paul's judgment was that Demas was no longer serving the Lord. And there's a lesson in that as well. You can be a faithful servant. but it's important to remain faithful. People sometimes do walk away. And as Paul says, I'm pretty sure it's in Corinthians, where he talks about what we bring before the Lord. We can bring gold, precious, gold and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And he says, and we will be saved as though by fire, but we won't have anything of worthiness to present to the Lord. I'm not saying Demas lost his salvation. That's my opinion and a possibility. If you are genuinely saved, as Jesus said, no man shall take him out of my Father's hand. That no man is even myself. I can't take myself out of God's hand once I'm truly saved. I can be faithful, faithless. But I'm sure that even though I may be saved, I probably won't hear that, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And again, faithfulness to the Lord, to the end, is our goal. No matter how hard the circumstance, Paul was willing to go, as he said, to be poured out as a drink offering. And yes, he died a martyr's death. He was faithful to the end. 
And we see that that is so important and that none of us can say that we will be there unless we have God's help in staying faithful. I can't say that 20 years from now, I'll be faithful to God. I can say that right now I'm going to do my best and by God's grace and with his help, I will continue to be faithful. But we are all capable of turning away. And even as Christians, we're capable of doing pretty horrific things. And we should never think about the fact that we're not capable. We should never say, I would never do such a thing as what this other person did because that flesh is still there. That temptation is still there. That desire to show anger and all the other things in our lives are still there. And it's important for us to understand that it's God's grace that keeps us from taking those steps, from that impulse, that impulsive rash act to turn ourselves away from God. And it's interesting to notice what Paul says about Laodicea, which is, inter which is also kind of, in verse 16, he says, when this letter is read among you, have also, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. So Paul is talking about reading this letter. You know, th this is a circular letter. It wasn't just to the Colossians. He wanted it to move on so that the Laodiceans would also hear it. And he says, and you, for your part, read my letter that was coming from Laodicea. And that's also an interesting piece of information to think about. Not every letter Paul wrote ended up in the Bible. And here we see a direct mention of a letter that Paul wrote that we don't see a book of Laodicea in the Bible. He wrote a letter to the Laodiceans. He wanted that letter to be read to the Colossians as well, but it didn't end up in the Bible. Who knows why, other than for some reason, these are the books God chose. These are the ones God wanted for us to have as history. And it's important to understand, this is genuine history. The books that are in the Bible are there because God chose to have these specific books as the canon of Scripture. We can't fathom why he chose one over the other other than for some reason the one that was written to the Colossians was God breathed and the one to the Galatians or to the Thessalonians may have just been very sim similar to what had been written to the Colossians. And so what's the point in having duplicates? I don't know if that's the case other than, you know, Paul mentions the letter wanted that it read to them but we don't have it to read that we know of and then in verses 17 and 18 he says i say to archippus take heed to the ministry which you have received in the lord that you may fulfill it Again, Paul is encouraging Archippus here to be careful or take heed to the ministry that he may fulfill it. And then he says, the greeting is in my own hand. Paul is saying, I wrote this greeting in my own hand. And he says, again, he signs it, Paul. And then he says, remember 
my chains. Grace be with you. Again, he's reminding them, yes, he is in chains. And he's in chains, as he says in other epistles, for their sake. And his final reminder, grace be to you. Remember how he started the the letter, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord. Now, he started most of his letters that way. And he always starts grace first and peace second. That's because peace with God depends on the grace of God. And the only way we have peace with God is if we receive the gift of God, the gift of salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and all that you've done for us. We thank you for the love and the grace and the kindness that you've shown to us. We pray that you'd work in our hearts and help us to grow in you and to love you. Help us to truly walk in your grace and understand that it's by your grace that we can be steadfast and that we can walk in what you would have us to walk. In Jesus' name, amen.